and I understand that the Communist Party in Germany under Nazi occupation used so many intermediate steps to protect their communication that it could take up to a month for a message to get from one cell to another. Um, and so that's why this system works, because it really cuts down on those kinds of delays when anything is time sensitive. And even though I used a number of examples of paramilitaries, this system is not used strictly for kind of armed, you know, uh, command and control networks. The civilian part of the kind of the non-armed part of the African National Congress used a similar structure as well. And the reason for that was that they had people organized on kind of a neighborhood basis. So this cell might be, you know, all of the people who lived on a certain street in Johannesburg. And they would send up, you know, information about what was going on and their activities to the kind of central organizing group. And then that, and they would say, you know, also what they wanted to do because it was more participatory. And then that group would send back down information about what was happening with the struggle or educational materials or all of these different things. And of course, there are above ground hierarchies as well. Many NGOs, uh, especially larger NGOs, work on this in this fashion. And the point of this diagram is really just to illustrate that in an above ground hierarchy, there are you know, all of these people who still know each other, and there's not that compartmentalization. So this is a, I wanted to kind of clarify uh, how some of these groups might actually function, why they might have these different cells, and importantly, how um, underground groups and above ground groups uh, can get along so that they can kind of maximize each other's effectiveness while still making everyone as safe as possible. So on the left side is an underground network uh, like the one that we've seen previously. But they're set up so that each of these cells has its own specific function. So for example, here's an intelligence gathering group. Here's a propaganda group. Uh, over there on the far side is a group that's uh, you know, recruiting people, recruiting new cells. And on the right-hand side is an above-ground movement of people who are kind of you know, loosely connected, uh, maybe in affinity groups, maybe in other kinds of organizations. And the important defining feature here is the firewall, is that there's always this firewall maintained between the two sides, that these people do not know who these people are. They do not know that they're part of some kind of underground group. These people uh, probably do know a lot about these folks, um, and that can help you know, ensure that underground groups or that underground networks have more information, for example. Um, so here in this part of the image, you can see um, informants, people who are passing information on to the resistance movement. They might just be researchers. They might be people who work in you know, a, a government or a business office or other people who have special kind of information that the resistance wants. And so they pass that across the firewall. But the important thing is that the information that crosses the firewall is, is stripped of identifying information, and it's one way. And that's what makes it safer, because whenever people are getting close to the firewall, it can get really dangerous for, for people on both sides. So if someone's going to pass information across here, they might use something like, like a dead drop, like the brick behind a wall, or uh, you know, it could be an electronic dead drop. But they don't know exactly who the information is going to, and they don't know all of the people in this group. So this person knows who they are, but they don't know who this person is. And they can go the opposite way as well. So this might be a propaganda group who would send out you know, communiques or that sort of thing. And they might send information to uh, the media or to a press office. You know, this is how the ELF press office works. So they'll, just, they'll send this information across the firewall. But again, it's stripped of any identifying information, and it's one way. So it only goes to this person, and they don't know what's going on over here. See everybody. Right. So the issue is that, in this case, if you take out kind of these top three connecting people, then it could destroy the entire network. And that's a real issue. And that's why underground movements that are effective and that want to be robust think a lot about weighing different kinds of risk against each other. So they think about, you know, more communication links means potentially more risk um, in terms of people being exposed. But fewer communication links means more risk in that it's easier 
that for the network to be disrupted or kind of cut into pieces if there are arrests or captures. And so there's usually kind of backup methods. So you know, these people might be able to connect to someone in this other cell in an emergency or through a specific method, you know, if they're caught. Um, but they might not use that communication under normal circumstances because that would, of course, expose it. What's going on on the far side there is that there are some people who are not actually in the cell, but who are maybe uh, going to be recruited. They're candidates. And so someone from this group, this person here, has approached them probably because obviously these people don't know, know them to approach. They've approached these potential recruits and um, started some kind of you know, screening and recruitment process. And usually underground organizations have pretty well-developed systems for recruiting people and for screening people. That's especially if they've been around for a while. Because if they don't develop good screening, they're not around for a while. Um, and so these people, even though they're on the list, they're still outside of that, that kind of bubble um, from this particular sales bubble. So they might know this person, but they don't know anyone else. And they're not going to be in that cell until they've kind of proved themselves or they've been appropriately screened. And maybe they'll never even be in this cell. Maybe this person will split off and join and, and form a new cell out of these potential recruits. Um, and then, you know, he or she will be the link to, to this other cell. And that, you know, that, that might be how it works. Yes. yes. So the question is, do we have resources about screening uh, and recruitment, and the answer is yes. There's a discussion in Deep Green Resistance, the book. Um, there's actually a chapter on recruitment, um, and there's a section that talks about different screening methods that historical resistance movements um, have used quite specifically. So hopefully that will answer uh, most of the questions about that. Yes. So the question is, with DGR in specific, but it applies to all movements in general, if you're thinking about underground action or if someone is considering forming an underground group, should they avoid being part of an above ground group? And the answer is yes, exactly so. Um, you know, in the, in the French resistance, at first they didn't have any kind of distinction between above ground and underground uh, as clearly as, as we do here. And so a lot of people ended up getting captured or arrested because they were, you know, part of a sabotage group, but they were also, you know, carrying around underground newspapers and this sort of thing. And so what happened was uh, they kind of began to coalesce into two different kinds of organizations. There were, uh, under, there were groups called networks and called movements. And movements were resistance groups that tended to recruit more uh, more widely, they had much larger numbers of people involved, they had kind of looser connections, and they were really focused around general organization of, of political dissent, encouraging uh, you know, people to, to hate the Nazis, they published underground newspapers and that sort of thing. Um, in contrast to the movements, the networks were very small, tight, tightly organized, much more secretive, and they had specific objectives that they wanted to accomplish. So the network, there might be a network for sabotaging rail lines. There might be a network for organizing you know, communications workers. There might be a network for gathering information from inside the Vichy regime. And one of the first rules they, they established was that you could either be a, movement, a member of a movement or a network, but not both, because that would put you know, both groups at risk. And I think that really parallels what we see here, that the movements are, in, in some ways, much more like the above-ground movements. Um, and of course, that's different because they were still secretive. But you know, there are stories in the south of France about people walking into a newspaper office and successfully asking for the office of the resistance. So there are certainly you know, places where those, where those movements were similar to what we would call above-ground. Mm -hmm.